It's war games, but not as you know it. Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this. It's another episode of 1998 Was It Great. Tonight, we're going to be looking at WCW Fall Brawl. From 1998, surprisingly. It's September the 13th and we're live at the Lawrence Joel Veterans Memorial Coliseum, which is a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? In Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Deep, deep, deep in Ric Flair country. The venue has hosted Fall Brawl from 1996 to 1999. And for some reason I haven't written down how many people are there because I'm awful really, aren't I? Tony, Tony Schiavone starts the show trying to tell us all about the new rules that there are for war games. I say tries because you can barely hear what he's saying because there is a huge, and I do not under overestimate, I don't overstate that, it is huge, deafening, we want flair chant. That's tomorrow night, lads. That's tomorrow night, I've read. So yeah, new rules for war games, which we'll talk about later. We go backstage where we see Ernest Miller being held back from somebody. We don't know who. He's saying I'm the greatest a lot, but he's being held back, but we don't see what's happening. Uh, we then go to Gene Mean, who starts to run down the card, but then out comes Jericho to nuclear hit. Oh, ridiculous. These guys, this crowd hate these guys. And he's got a scoop for Gene Mean. Tonight, he announces, it's Jericho versus Goldberg. Championship versus championship. Happy days. The crowd like this a lot and a massive... Goldberg chant breaks out. Before we go on with this show, should we start some? Should we talk about something that happened recently? August the seventeenth, nineteen ninety-eight, saw the return of the Ultimate Warrior to the wrestling world after two years away. Hulk Hogan was in the ring, cutting his usual rambling promo, and he said the following words: "He said there isn't a warrior in the world that I can't beat." Oh, them's fighting words, you know. Ultimate Warrior is there in parts unknown, just doing what he does, talking about queering, don't make the world work, and all that. And he hears using his mullet or something, he hears Hogan's words and decides, I'm marrying none of that, and mysteriously happens to, you know, just transport himself, I guess, to the arena, the lights go out, and um, Tony, you know, and yeah, out come, the fans went absolutely fucking bonkers, Tony screaming out, it's the warrior, Hogan, to his credit, was amazing here, because he sat there open mouth with his little bottom lip quivering, like he's that scared. Fucking fantastic. There's no fucking way that Vinnie Mac will let him use the name Ultimate Warrior, of course. Um, but they can call him Warrior because for some reasons that I just cannot fathom, Jim Helwig legally changed his name to Warrior. So that's all good. Hogan tried to offer him an NWO shirt. Warrior responded with, You might want to use that to clean up the mess you've made of yourself. Very funny. Warrior then talked and talked and talked. You've never beaten a warrior, especially an ultimate one, he says. He goes on and on and on about Radius 6. Rips from the Disciple, call him Hogan's Barber. Once again, that's funny. He then told Bischoff if he ever got in Warrior's business, he would be it would be his demise. He talks about Hogan being evil and that he has more power. He has the power, he has the power, Warrior has the power to destroy Hogan. He continues with a great line, which is, beating you means nothing anymore. Everybody already has. <laughs> Hogan looked hurt by the comment. Warrior concluded, that's too easy, because you felt guilty being who you were. Your mind became weak and Hulkamania became boring. I came here, Hogan, to tell you that next week I intend to launch a revolution not even you can control. I asked you to find the courage... Check it out. Next week, same warrior time, same warrior place, same warrior channel. Plumes of smoke appeared and he vanished. 15 minutes. This went 15 minutes. I've been told, although I'm, it was probably in the death of WCW, no, me, that um, this was meant to go about five minutes and he just rambled on and on and on to the point, I think, to the point where you see Bischoff in the background saying, can you wrap this up? You can see, come on, get on with it. The thing is, this worked. This worked like a fucking charm. The segment... Pulled a 6.4 racing for Nitro, just that segment. 
which, um, yeah, was the biggest of the Monday Night War until that point. So, well done, Nitro. You did good there. Uh, it meant that Nitro won Night as well, a 4.2 rating to Raw's 4.2. Raw, yeah, they must have known that Warrior was going to be there or something because they put on a fucking marquee match over on their TV show. Yes, while Warrior was gassing on about goodness knows what when he was in the ring, the WF promoted <laughs> Bart Gunn versus the Godfather in a brawl for all match. Yay. Our opening contest tonight is the British Bulldog and Jim Neidhart defeating the Dancing Fools in a rubbish opener. I don't know again who the heels are in this one, just like last time with the Dancing Fools. With the Dancing Fools, we obviously get a fair amount of stalling, as you can probably imagine, they like dancing. Tony Schiavone calls a drop toe hold a spectacular manoeuvre. I'd love to see Love to know what Tony Schiavone calls a double rotation moonsault, for example, if a fucking drop toe hold is a spectacular manoeuvre. I know everyone looks tiny compared to the British Bulldog because he's fucking huge. Alex Wright looks like a small child compared to, well, a teenage teenager, doesn't he? Because he's so thin and Bulldog is so massive. Anyway, that's the point. Disco is your dancing full in peril, quick tags by the heels which is, in this case, it's Bulldog and Neidhart. They're the ones who do the quick tags. Um, all nothing of note, though. Wright gets the mild tag to Disco as the fans demand flair, and, oh, God, they demand flair. He backdrop and slams Bulldog. The backdrop um, by the Bulldog top man, he landed on the trap door that Warrior was using, you know, when the smoke filled with... Ri when the ring filled with... When the smoke filled with ring... Oh early in the morning when the ring filled with smoke yeah what there was a trap door warrior could get in and out of bulldog landed on that fucked up his back something fierce uh, it hospitalized him for six months um due to a staph spinal infection uh, anyway after some miscommunication by the fools bulldog is able to get a weak looking power slam on disco for the win at 11 minutes and three seconds you complain if this match was on nitro let's put it this way especially at that length no 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 crowd wanted to enjoy it but there's nothing for them to cheer for and if it breaks it literally into one of those little oh for fuck's sake sort of things that you add on you tack on to the end of things like this yeah Excuse me. Bulldog would never wrestle for the WC for WCW again, and Bischoff would fire him via FedEx. You stay classy. In the back, Gene Mean says there's a dirty rumor that Scott Steiner will not face his brother tonight. He finds Scott, who has a band-aid on his arms and a bag of ice on his back. Buff tells us that Scott is injured and has a doctor's note. Gene gets JJ fucking Dylan, who has absolutely none of it, rips up the doctor's note, says, "Look, tonight you fight or you barred from WCW for life." Next, Chris Jericho defeating Goldberg in a title versus title match. You what? I hear you saying if you've never seen this show. You what? Jericho beat Goldberg. So Jericho has Ralphus with him and his crack security team, and they do Goldberg's entrance, but it's funny because they get lost three times to the point where Jericho shouts out, Where's the guy going? Very, very funny. They have to start looping Jericho's music. It takes him that long to get to the ring. <sighs> anyway. It's all good, because I mean, this is what I'm writing down. Bear in mind, I've not seen this before. It's all good, and it's entertaining, and it's funny, because you know that when Goldberg comes out, he's going to demolish Jericho. Happy days are here again, all right? It's just like that. But wait, it's a big-ass bait-and-switch, because Goldberg is actually an imposter. The fans are less than impressed, chanting bullshit, as they are quite right to do. Jericho knows that tells the spear, and the Lion Tamer gets the win. I get this, 1 minute, 15 seconds. I have no problem with this, promise you, I don't, right? If it goes somewhere. So at Halloween Havoc, it has got to be Goldberg versus Jericho. Now, because we know that the main event tonight, the winner gets a title shot at Goldberg, at Halloween Havoc, you guess that's not going to happen. So it achieves nothing. The, the intro bit where Jericho got lost, uh, that was very, very amusing. As a match, this was awful, as you can probably imagine. And it, like I say, because Goldberg didn't want to work with Jericho, because he doesn't do comedy, brother, you know, it's one of those pointless. It just is a pointless waste of time. Rick Steiner is with Lee Marshall. Lee Marshall says that billions of people want to see the Steiner Brothers face off. Billions. Wrestling was hot at the time, you know, we know this. It's September 1998. Wrestling is hot, yeah? Billions? No. 
no, no, no. Rick says he will do what he, ha what he has to do to, do to win tonight, and he will teach his brother a lesson. We throw to an interview, conduct this is ridiculous, conducted by Mike Tenay on Thunder, right? And it's, <laughs> I'm Mike Tenay for WCW International Television. I'm here on Thunder, would have done, Mike. Uh, he's talking to two of the Armstrong brothers. I don't know which ones they are. He doesn't get a... Sorry, the, the Armstrong brothers don't get a single word in there because Ernest Miller comes out and objects to them getting interview times. And one of the brothers, like, we never get interview time. Let us, let, us, let us have a time. Miller's having none of it and boots him in the face. Norman Smiley, hooray, makes the save. And and then you sat there going, hang on a sec, does that mean... Oh, God, that means the next match. Yeah, here it is. Yes, yeah, Ernest Miller defeating Norman Smiley in a nothing match. Miller cuts a promo before the bell. Uh, saying he will give Smiley five seconds to get out of the ring, which of course he doesn't. I need to point out that when the bell goes for this one, yeah, that it's 39 minutes into the show. Bear in mind that Jericho and Goldberg went one minute and, um, yeah, the um, open went 11 minutes. You start going, get on with it for fuck's sake. Honestly, right, there is. There's a nice spinning back suplex by Smiley. That's the highlight. A pair of feliners get the win. Honestly, there is nothing to this match. Five minutes, four seconds. I mean, yeah, three matches so far, three duds. And you start going, I have got such high expectations for this next match. Please be good. Please, you have to be good. <sighs> Rick Steiner for Scott Steiner to a no contest. In one of those on my notes, I've got, of fucking course he did, in capital letters. This feud started back in February. Just as a reminder, I write the notes and then write whoever who won after the match is finished. So I've got all my notes, and then it's the fought to a no contest, so I've added in. Of course he fucking did. Uh, this feud started back in February. The match was meant to happen at Road Wild, but Scott faked an injury. JJ fucking Dylan says if Scott doesn't face Rick here, he is barred from WCW for life. This is Rick's comeback match after rotator cuff surgery, while Scott has returned to action a week ago after suffering from a neck injury. Thanks to NWA Wolfpack for that information. He put a comment on my road while bed, which I was very interested in. We had an intense school fest to start, and the crowd just erupts because they want to see this match. Rick gets a clothesline to Scott Bales. Rick follows and beats him all over ringside. Back inside, Scott goes low to counter belly to belly and batters Rick at ringside. Inside, he tries a butterfly suplex, but Rick is able to snap off a DDT to another big pop. Buff tries to interfere, but is thrown into the turnbuckle, which he sells like he's dead. Oh yes. Brawling again, but the ref has noticed that Buff isn't moving. Scott checks on him. Buff is saying, it's my neck, over and over again. Now, we have to backtrack just a little bit here. Um, back in April, uh, Rick Steiner had given a bulldog to Buff Bagwell, botched it. Buff had scuffered a legitimate broken neck, all right? Um, Buff returned in July, asked Rick to come out so he could forgive him, but it was just another end of the swerve as Buff held Rick so Scott could attack him and all those, for goodness sake. Fans chant bullshit, and quite rightly, for the second time tonight, as this match is thrown out because some bloke who interfered has injured himself, and you're going, that's Utter shit. Five minutes thirty. And get this, it gets worse. Get this here. The commentators sell it like it's legit, as they quite rightly should, alright? Now, <laughs> Buff is put on a stretcher. Sorry, stretcher's wheeled out. Buff is put on it. It's wheeled to the back, into an ambulance chair. This takes ten minutes of this pay per view. I swear to God, that's the truth. As we are told, this is a great one. Tony Shares says, we, wouldn't, we can't go to our next match because the guys aren't ready yet. They, um, they didn't expect the Steiner match to be so short. And he started going, that's bollocks as well. Like, well you mean they're not sit in their gear ready to go? Bollocks. <sighs> the ambulance doors are shut. Everyone leaves. Rick Steiner looks absolutely gutted. He really does. And say it with me. Scott and Buff attack Rick. It was a setup all along. Oh, my God. There was flashes, ever so brief, of a great match here because Jesus wept the fans want to see this match. We're sick and tired of waiting for this. Come on, give us Rick versus Scott. No. No, no, no. And because of that, because of those little flashes of greatness, I genuinely believe that these two will actually finally face off at Halloween Havoc. Although, I can see them doing another bait and switch there and actually having the feud end at Starcade. And I've got to be honest, if that's where they go, all right, okay, but this was shit. This was rubbish. A horrible, horrible finish. Hoover 2 Guerrero defeating Silver King in a good match. 
to retain the Cruiserweight Championship. I'm sorry, I haven't a fucking clue who Silver King is. Uh, this is a rematch from Thunder after King got disqualified for reasons, apparently. So, first two minutes are better than the rest of the wrestling on this show combined. I know that's not much of a stretch, but it's decent cruiserweight action that the crowd like. It's all good. King gets two off a lovely tilt or a backbreaker, and the, the fans are so impressed by, by a puncher by Silver Kong, Silver King even, Salva King, Salva Kong, Silver King, that they chant Taco Bell at the pair of them. Americans, fuck yes. Hoovey misses a sunset flip attempt, but King calmly punches Hoovey in her face to cover it up. And it was a bit of a botch, but it's a yeah, nice touch that. Hoovey gets two off a of Rana, as does a missile dropkick. King gets two off a of super kick, and then Hoovey does something that I just did not see coming, and pop like an absolute motherfucker for, as Hoovey goes up hop and hits a fucking super reverse Rana. And anyone who knows me knows that, knows that the reverse Rana is my favorite. Favourite fucking wrestling move of all the times. It is the best, alright? This one doesn't even look that good, honestly, because he comes down, because Silver King comes down, he does a flip, he does a full rotation in midair, basically, comes down on his fucking stomach instead of on his head like he should. Come down on your fucking, fucking bronze. But even so, I'm going to give this match an extra star for it, just because, you know, Jesus Christ, where did that come from? <laughs> Look, it's an objectable thing to be in a review. I'm allowed to do that. If I think, you know, it's like, it's like the Tiger Suplex principle. It's like, if the match has got Tiger Suplex in, give it an extra star, even if it looks shit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, and it gets two. It should have been the finish. It really should. The commentators, to a man, all three of them, are mega impressed by that move. They are like, I can't, I've never seen that before. I can't believe it. Hoover Driver and 450 Splash get the win at 8 minutes and 36. Match was a breath of fresh air after the previous four matches. It, have, it wasn't anything special, honestly. It wasn't anything great. It wasn't one of those, you've got to go back and watch this Cruiserweight match because it's the best thing you'll ever see. It's just, like I say, after the rest of the show, this is wonderful. It really, really is. In the back, Conan is talking at the internet position, but he's run interrupted by drunk Scott Hall, who throws a drink at Conan, which seems a bit of a waste if you ask me. But over in the double draft, we have them running a store. I'm based on Hawk's uh, alcohol problems. So naturally, we've got Hall, I mean, uh, Hawks drinking problems. So over here, we've got Hall's drinking problems. And you start going, I don't care. This is not going to make me want to buy a pay per view or tune into Nitro or anything. Saturn defeating Raven next in a good Raven's Wolves match. Lodi, had been, who I wrote, right? I wrote my notes, right? I wrote Lodi as low key because I watched Thor the night before. Watched Reddit as low key. Every time, so I have to go back and change him. Lodi had beaten Saturn in a match where if Saturn lost, he had to do he had to be Lodi's um, servant. I thought slave. That sounds horrible. Until four brawl. Well, if Saturn won, Lodi would have to leave the flock. Lodi won. Okay. Raven demanded that Lodi tell Scott Saturn to break Scotty Riddler's fingers, but because Saturn has honor and integrity, he wouldn't do it. So Raven basically gave him a choice: either break his fingers or I'll break yours. And because Saturn's got so much honor and integrity, he chose to have his own fingers broken. Uh, some point later, it didn't say it doesn't say on the build. We have a builder package for this, which I'm very happy about. But at some point later, they didn't tell us when. It's Canyon versus some guy called Nick Dinsmore. Of course, it's Eugene to you and me. But Lodi wasn't there, so he couldn't control Saturn. So Saturn broke Canyon's fingers in revenge. Why not? Tonight, if Saturn wins, the flock is disbanded. But if Raven wins, Saturn is Raven's servant forever. Oh, and Canyon is handcuffed to the ring as well. Wouldn't it be interesting, right, if they did a stipulation in wrestling like this, like, like, you know, it's forever. And they, it's like, this was in 1998, yeah, and to this day, they're still doing it. And so imagine if, for example, if Raven won this match, and Saturn is still Raven's uh, servant. How good would that be? It's like, stip yeah, they should have stipulations like this. People should enforce them. You know, Kurt Angle's still bald, for fuck's sake. Come on. Ah, right, so Raven cuts a promo before the bell, obviously. As does Saturn, actually, now I think about it. Lodi has a sign that reads, right, get this, Saturn is bald. Which is true. He is. That's an informative um, sign there. Well done. Saturn starts off in control with a sidekick and an atomic drop that a flying forearm for two. A splash also gets two. And then Raven is knocked off the apron into the rail. Saturn with a plunge onto Lodi and Raven. Lodi pulls Saturn off the apron onto the rail to give Raven time to recover. 
Hits a pair of elbows off Retrope for two. Counters a sunset flip. Then hits a clothesline. Main event sleeper by Raven is countered into a jawbreaker. Rolling Russian leg sweeps by Raven are really, really nice. And they get two. A chair is brought in for the drop toe hold onto the chair. It's not called a spectacular move, this one, by Tony Schiavone. And you start going, so what? A standard one is, but a drop toe hold onto a chair, that's just a meh. Who cares? Yeah, weird. Tony Schiavone. Um, flop bring a table out, but Kidman comes out and drop kicks Raven. Turns on Raven and drop kicks him, allowing Saturn to hit a death by driver, but the ref is distracted by the ref by the flop, so Raven can kick out when he eventually you know, covers at two. The rest of the flock could chase Kidman away. Pop was big for the drop kick, and now a massive Saturn chant goes up. He hits a T-bone suplex, he has a belly to belly suplex, and then a springboard, springboard guillotine leg drop for two. A Mishinoku driver gets two for Saturn, a trade cradle gets two for Raven. Rings of Saturn pops the crowd again. Lodi makes a save. He goes up top, but is kicked off. Ref is bumped. So Canyon can... Oh, this is this is such a clever little thing. Canyon uncuffs himself, right? Because the ref has fallen down next to him. He's got the key, in his, the key to his handcuffs in his pocket, hasn't he? So Canyon gets the key, undoes his handcuffs, gets in the ring, hits Saturn with a flatliner, then goes back into the corner, put the cuffs on, and wakes the referee up. But... The resulting near fall only gets two. Jesus Christ, it's the closest near fall on the pay view. The crowd are so into it. It's unreal. It's absolutely fucking brilliant. And then, right, bear in mind what I said before, Lodi getting knocked off. Yeah, he's just sat straddled up on the top turn. Up, going, Jesus Christ, my bollocks have swelled up to the side of Grapefruit or something like that. I just don't get down. He just sat there. So Saturn sort of noticed him and goes, hmm, he's there. There's a table there. Whatever can we do? And he goes and grabs him, puts him on his shoulders, hits a fucking Death Valley driver off the apron through the table, and it looks brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. One problem, of course, this all they all doing this gives Raven time to recover. So Saturn gets into the ring and walks straight into an even flow. Again, the near fall is fantastic. It, you believe it's the win. You're like, oh my god, he's gonna be the he's, uh, he's gonna be his, his servant forever. One, two, kick out straight away, transitions it into the Death Fly Driver for the win at 14 minutes, four seconds. Man, I love this match. That maybe it's because the rest of the show was really rubbish. I thoroughly enjoyed this match so much more than I was expecting to. Honest to God, I really, really enjoyed it. Um it was a Ravens Rules match, but there wasn't m much weapon usage. If you think about it, it was the, te the table bump and one drop toe hold onto a chair. That's it. All right? The Ravens Rules m were more so that, like, for example, the big Kidman could um, leave the flock and interfere. You know, for example, th shit like that. I, yeah, crowd were into every second of it. Um, right result. Sam was able to get his revenge on Lodi because, of course, he'd been patrolling him. Got his revenge on Raven. Oh, this is fantastic. And this is one of those times where, look, you can transition Sam from this into something else, into something better. And they probably won't. And another good match. Bloody hell. Dean Malenko defeating Kurt Henning in a good match. These two had a cage match on Nitro the week before. In one of those, that makes no sense. You saw you have your standard match and you have your cage match here. But no, they had a cage match. Naturally, this one ended when Bischoff came out and unlocked the cage door so that Rick Rude could get in, attack um, Dean Malenko, who had Kurt Henning in the cloverleaf at the time, during a disqualification. Because why not? A disqualification in a fucking cage match. That is fucking stupid. Ah, oh, this is billed as a grudge match. You shouldn't say that if it's not going to be a grudge match, right? Because this is the thing. Kurt has a big-ass knee brace on again, right? And Dean does the right thing. He works the leg, driving it into the ring post. Fans chant, fans think I show their appreciation for this one by chanting, we want flair, even louder than the previous two times. <laughs> ah, Kurt tries a slam, but the knee gives out. Fucking yes. Dean continues on the knee because Kurt until Kurt desperately rakes the eyes in front of the ref. No disqualification because WCW, obviously. Kurt gets a head scissors stomp, right? And it's fucking brilliant because he sells the leg as he lands. Oh, it's great. Dean knocks him down, drops knees to the injured knee. and Henning tries to bail and Dean has none of it. Puts him back on the ring where he begs and Henning tries to say, like, you four, four horsemen for life and all that. <laughs> Dean, again, has absolutely none of it. Drop kicks the knee and applies a big-ass leg lock. Rude helps Kurt break it, so Dean calmly pulls Kurt into the middle of the ring and puts the leg lock on again. I fucking love shit like that. It's absolutely brilliant. Oh, dear me. R uh, Dean goes for something. Sorry, Dean. Come on, get, get your pace back. <sighs> 
Dean tries to sorry, Kurt tries to escape out of the leg lock, and as he's getting up, Kurt, Dean just calmly again just hits him with a fucking back belly to back suplex because he can. He goes for something, and what I mean by that is he go, runs into the ropes, and as he's in the ropes, Rick Rude knees him in the back. This allows Henning to go for the head, the perfect plex. I'm not going to call it the Henning plex. That sounds fucking stupid. Goes for the perfect plex, yeah. As he lifts him up, knee gives out. Fucking brilliant. And Dean, again, I'm sorry to keep saying this, but as calm as you can be, yeah, just goes, well, if it didn't work for you, it'll work for me, bitches. Hits a fisherman suplex. Absolutely fantastic. Oh, dear me. But then he puts on, he goes for the, um, goes for the cover. Rude. Uh, breaks it. Disqualification at 7 minutes and 38 seconds. Rude and Henning attack after the bell, but Arn Anderson makes the save and gets owned. In fact, Rude and Henning break his arm. So you start going, right, this is the time. Here comes Flair. No, there's no Flair. That's tomorrow night, boys. Sorry, but no. It would have been perfect. Honestly, I really think it would. The thing is, what's really bad about this is there's two things. The first one is the psychology in this was faultless. I mean, it's absolutely faultless. It's technical wrestling. You know what that means. It's silence, obviously. Maybe the crowd are a bit burnt out by saving. Saving? Saving by the saving match beforehand, but I mean, I don't like the finish, but I did like the storytelling aspect of it. I really like that bit of it. Um, yeah, the second thing that I really don't like about this one is, is it's classic NWO, and what I mean by that is you've got the NWO boys in Henning and Rude beating down on Anderson, and no one comes out to make the save. It's fucking on Anderson. The guy's meant to be a legend. Come on, mate. Can someone come make the save? No, fuck that. Fuck it. Ah, so then, um, yeah, that, that's the good part of the show, over, the, over and done with. <laughs> Conan defeating Scott Hall in a match. <laughs> uh, Hall is absolutely smashed. I mean, he's staggering all over the place. He does the survey, right, and uh, stumbles through his words and all that. Fans do react to the wolf pack, though, we'll give him that one. Hall gets us laughing by swapping rings. Cause just don't forget, there's two rings out there because it's War Games tonight. Match starts with a commentator saying that the, NW, the black and white NWO are the hottest thing in pro wrestling today. Now, I'd argue, maybe it's because I was pro WWF, but I'd argue that Stone Cold Steve Austin is the hardest thing in wrestling today. But that's just me. <coughs> oh, Hall wants to test the strength. Conan has enough of the games and whacks him so full. Hall falls between the two rings. That's funny. On the outside, Vincent gives Hall a drink. He puts on a long surfboard stretch, hits a full waist slam, and then an abdominal stretch, making sure to have a drink off Vincent before he puts the move. You know, while he puts the, the, the stretch on and making you know, reach out for you know, he as a, as a heel, he should reach out for the ropes, doesn't he? But no, he reaches out for the drink, has a drink, and then reaches for the ropes. And he's like, going, this is just sad. There's a brawl or something going off of the entrance way. Crowd are more interested in watching that than anything else. Than anything that happens in the ring. Hall gets a super belly to back suplex, but doesn't cover as he wants a drink. And this is the mistake because Conan kicks the drink away, hits an X Factor, and gets the win with a tequila sunrise at 12 minutes and 1 seconds. This match was utter shit. The drinking thing could be entertaining if the performer that was doing the character didn't have a history of alcohol abuse, which Hall does. So it's just sad to watch. It's really, really sad. And it's once again, it's a look. This doesn't make me want to tune into Nitro. This doesn't make me want to buy a pay-per-view. This character is a waste of time. It's that simple for me. It's that simple. The other thing about this one is that Hall battered Conan. So his win looks like a fluke. Because he got two moves in. He got a punch. And he got the X Factor. And he got the Secure Sunrise. That's it. Conan's shit. Utter shit. And then, DDP wins the War Games match, the match beyond. Now then, this is very, very important. This year, they've decided in their infinite wisdom to change the rules of the match. But, let's just have a reminder of ourselves. Let's talk about the old rules, right? The ones that have been in place since 1985 or whenever the first War match, I don't even care, when the first, whenever the first War Games match, as far as I know, the, the rules haven't changed until this point. So, my friend Joey, who is the biggest War Games fan I know, is going to just ex quickly explain to us, just explain to us, Joey, what the rules are to War Games. Thanks, Mark. War Games, the match beyond. Now, before the rule change in 1998, the rules of the match were actually real, real easy. Two teams would compete in War Games, either four on four or five on five. They would compete in either seven or nine periods, is what the match consisted of. The first period being five minutes long, the s all other periods would be two minutes in length. The way the match started, each team sends one man into the double ring, double cage for a five minute fight. After the first five minutes, 
there would be a coin toss. Whoever won the coin toss got to send its second man in, giving them a two-on-one advantage for the first two-minute period. After that two-minute period, the team which lost the coin toss sends its second guy in, evening up the sides at two apiece. Now the teams are going to alternate back and forth, sending one man in at a time until all eight or ten men are inside the cage. After that, the rules are real easy. Submission or surrender is the only way to win. No pinfalls, no countouts, no disqualifications, no stopping the match for injury, and more importantly, no time limit. They could fight all night until someone says I quit. That's it. Those are the rules. Real easy to follow. Unless you're Roddy Piper and decide to change everything. Back to you, Mark. Sounds simple, doesn't it? Cheers for that, Jerry. It sounds simple and it sounds good. It does. It sounds good. It's like, it makes sense. And it's a feud ender and it's a, you know, a chance to see the hated manager, for example, like JJ fucking down in there getting beats or whatever. This year, things are different. First off the bat, we're going to get three teams now. Three teams of three. Two men will start the match uh, for a five-minute period, and then a new competitor will enter every two minutes. This match can end at any point, not when all the men are in the ring. No, 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 no. This one can end at any point and can also end by pinfall or submission. The three teams in this match are Team Hollywood, which is Hogan, Bret Hart and Stevie Ray, Team Wolfpack, which is Lash, Luger and Sting, and Team WCW, which is DDP, Rowdy Roddy Piper and Warrior. More importantly than the teams, let's talk about this one. How many bumps would Kevin Nash take? After last month at Road Wild, I've got on my notes, fuck all! <laughs> and before the bell, they do one of those, I don't know why they're doing this. They announce that tomorrow night on Nitro, it's Goldberg defending the championship against Sting, which is fucking stupid on so many points. And we were Wolfpack points out on my last video. He said, look, look, Nitro was more important than pay-per-views. And it's one of those things, watching a pay-per-view like this, you're going, yep, yeah, that's fucking spot on. It's stupid on two counts, right? First things first, Goldberg isn't on this pay-per-view at all, right? Secondly, Sting, Goldberg versus Sting would bring in pay-per-view revenue, all right? So put that, I don't know, on this show, Sting, oh my god, Sting is wrestling in a match, right, to get a title shot, when he's already got one, he's already got a title shot tomorrow night, now I, I may be wrong here, but as far as I know, he's done bugger all to get the title shot, he's just got one, it makes no sense, it's stupid. So Brett and Page start us off. Nothing of note happens in the first five minutes other than a belly to belly suplex by Page. He tries a diamond cutter and Brett gets a nice backbreaker. Steve Ray is the third man out. Highlight of his two minutes is eating a double clothesline. Him and Brett's eating a double clothesline from Page. Sting is number four. It's a flying clothesline from one ring to the other. That looks really nice until he lands. He lands on the side. It takes the whole impact of the move on the side of his face. It looks horrible. He rams Stevie into the cage a few times while Brett gets a pile driver on Page. Rowdy Ruddy Papers, number five. He attacks everyone, including team captain Diamond Dallas Page, because it's every man for himself. That's what the commentators say. Look, it's every man for himself. So why have teams? It makes no sense. Oh, Luger is number six to a big pop. He gets a bionic forearm of death on Stevie Ray. Then it's a sleeper from Piper. Nash is number seven. He goes to jackknife Stevie, but out sneaks Hogan with something to hit Nash as Luger has the wreck of the rack on Brett. Hogan hits Luger and Sting with the, ob with the object. Heenan calls it a slapjack. I have no idea what it is, other than Heenan says that it's made of lead, all right? Isn't the slapjack Stevie Ray's finishing move? Just a thought. Um, Hogan drops the leg on Nash, who is still dead off the slapjack shot. Hogan hits a second one, doesn't bother going for a cover at any point in Stanley. No one does. All these men are dead in the ring. So you're telling me, right, that no one has the energy just to drape an arm over the guy? No, no, and no. Because... The ring fills with smoke, and he's Warrior, and he's attacked by Hogan straight away. And you're like, okay, that's interesting. The ring fills with smoke again. When it's cleared, Hogan is left holding Warrior's jacket, but Warrior's vanished. But wait, look, he's over there. He's sprinting to the fucking ring. Hogan says, 
fuck this, bails out of the cage because he doesn't obviously doesn't want his title shot. Steve gets home as everyone else is dead. Everyone else is completely dead. Warrior boots his way out of the cage, right? It, apparently, he manages to rip one of his muscles in his leg as he's booting the cage open, right? And then you can see quite clearly that when he lands, he's done something to his leg. Because when he goes to the post... As he goes to attack Hogan, and you know, they're being separated by all the fucking ring agents and Doug Dillinger and all that. Warrior's got one hell of a limp on him, and he's like going, Jesus, what have you done to yourself? And then, out of nowhere, three men start to recover in the ring, like Stevie Ray and DDP, Bret Hart. <laughs> DDP just shoves Bret out of the way, hits a diamond cutter on Stevie Ray, and that's it. That's the win. This match was shit, and it was utter shit. It was a multi-man match inside a double ring, double cage. This, folks, was not a War Games match. This was rubbish. It was so, so bad. It it existed to serve one purpose, and that existed to set up Hogan versus Warrior at Halloween Havoc, which I don't know about you, but I'm utterly and uninterested in watching. Ah. <sighs> Oh, dear me. So bad. So three matches on this show are two and a half stars or better. You know, two or three stars. That makes it a marked improvement, quality-wise, over what we saw at Roadblad, for example. But there are six matches on this one that are one star or less. Four of those matches are duds. The main event strays into minus territory because it's not a wrestling match. There's nothing in it that's a wrestling match. It doesn't. Maybe the first five minutes could be called a wrestling match, but the rest of it is just nothing. It's guys, not it's, it's guys selling smoke, isn't it? I assume that's why everyone got taken out. Everyone got taken out when Warriors Smoke hit the ring, right? So that just killed everyone. That's ridiculous. No Goldberg on the show. Ridiculous. Stupid. You're, he's, your, he's your world champion. It's so daft. It's so stupid. Do you reckon people? Do you reckon like people like Hull and I mean Hogan and Nash were saying to Bischoff and Bischoff say like he's not working. You know, he's not drawing as a champion. If the ratings are down, it's his fault. And you know, just just thinking to yourself like, look, they haven't given Goldberg any credible title shots. You know, champ, title challenges yet, apart from maybe Gold, Giant or Nitro. So you say, like, um, so what? You know, what, you can see that like, you know, your Bischoff's like, yeah, we need to take the fucking title off this guy, can't you? Fucking daft. It's so stupid. It's better than Road Wild, but not much better. I mean, it's a, Road Wild was a one out of ten because I was in a generous mood. If you really wanted to be generous, you give this one three. I'm not that. I'm not in that good mood today. I'm afraid this one's a two out of ten. Avoid at all costs. All right, there, folks. Airs that sound, ladies and gentlemen. I have been Mark P. I really hope you enjoyed this episode of 1998 was it great thank you very much to jerry for telling us about the war games match and thank you to my friend phil for the little logo that he's done for me for the how many bombs will kevin nash take i've been mark p hit that subscribe button hit that like button leave me a comment down below tell me what you thought of road wild 1998 and i'll be back very 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 soon take it easy guys